yet here I am. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and grab them. As I said to Will, we like to open this every single week. And as most of you know, we're going through the book of Colossians. And so this week, we're hitting a few verses here uh, in Colossians 1, verses 21 to uh, 23. And so that's where we will be today as we explore this book together. And you may remember a, f a few years ago, Nike ran an ad campaign that said, believe in something even if it means sacrificing everything. So that was, that was Nike's ad. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. And the face of this campaign was a former NFL quarterback, Colin Kaepernick, uh, who was well known for kneeling during the national anthem. You may remember these stories. And the ad sparked much conversation because the caption believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything, uh, didn't quite resonate well with some, uh, with the face of Kaepernick as the ad, even if kneeling may have costed him his job, because he was still a very successful person in terms of the world. He never had to give up the millions he made. In fact, he probably made several million just off of the ad campaign itself. He still had his house, his cars, his close relationships, and so on. And so for many, this ad flew in the face of those who have actually made significant sacrifices that cost everything, including their own lives. And some saw the flaw uh, in the ad, in the, in the wordage of the ad itself. Believe in something. But what does that mean? What if the thing you believe in isn't actually a good moral cause? Some plastered the text over the face, instead of Kaepernick, over the face of dictators and adversarial characters who in fact did believe in something. It's turned out not to be a good moral cause. Their something wasn't actually a good something. And a few even pointed out Nike's use of, of Chinese sweatshops that manufacture some of their goods. Where's the justice for those workers, some would say. So really what ended up being the, the conclusion for some was, was to say that it seems we are only to believe in something that is culturally and politically convenient or expedient to the day we live in. That was their critique. A tricky and ever-changing game in this world we live in. Relativism really is what it is, embodied. Believe in something is, is a relative statement. But in the Bible, we never see this type of relativism. We never hear the words believe in something. We hear believe in Jesus. Likewise, Paul does not talk about uh, persevering in, in your faith, whatever uh, that might be, that relative. He speaks of persevering in the faith. The faith. In fact, there, there can be no ambivalence towards matters of faith. You either believe or you don't. And Paul continually warns the reader, if, if you don't believe, let this be a fair warning to you. There is still no refuge from Jesus. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him as Lord in the end. There is only refuge in Jesus. And you hear those distinctions, I hope. There's no refuge from Jesus. Every tongue will bow, every knee confess, but there's only refuge in Jesus. So if you're going to believe in something, believe in this, believe in the gospel, believe in Christ. Now let's look at what Paul is urging us to believe in and what Christ has done for us in the work of salvation for us both past and present. Pick it up there in verse uh, 21. And you, who is this? This is us. And you, 
who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and which I, Paul, became a minister. Now in these, in these first two verses here, we see what Christ has done through his work of reconciliation. And we see two different states of ours. Before we were saved, and then what happens through the work of salvation. What Christ brings us into. And this former state that is described is, is rather harsh. Verse 21, we were alienated, hostile in mind, and doing evil deeds. Now, a lot of people don't like this. Uh, they don't like to be called these things naturally. It offends. And, and most people that are not Christian, they won't say that they are evildoers doing evil deeds. Or hostile in mind. Uh, no, they are, they are free moral thinkers, they would say. But interesting perspective that the Bible gives us, Jeremiah himself tells us, uh, we know that our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Above all else. They trick us. They lie to us. They deceive us. We think one thing about ourselves when it's actually not true at all. Have you met some of those people that think one thing about themselves and and the entirely opposite is true, maybe we should look in the mirror. In our hearts, we might say that we are a good person, and yet, when put to the test, it, it might turn out to be far from the truth, to something totally different. Uh, on April 15th, 1912, the Titanic made its fateful descent to the bottom of the North Atlantic. And on that infamous night, the extremes of human behavior were on full display, from cowardice to sacrificial love. But when the Titanic was gone, and the few life... For from the 1,600 people who were not able to make it into a lifeboat, only 13 were picked from the water by the 18 half-empty boats that were floating nearby. The book, A Night to Remember, recounts the scene in vivid detail. In one boat, 3rd Officer Pittman heard the anguished cries of the survivors. He turned the boat around and shouted, Now men, we will pull toward the wreck. But the passengers protested. Why should we lose our lives in a useless attempt to save others from the ship? Well, Pittman gave in. And for the next hour, their boat with 40 people on board and a, and a capacity of 65 heaved gently on the calm Atlantic while they listened to the fading cries of those around them. And sadly, this, this story wasn't unique to Pittman's boat. In another boat, 4th Officer Boxel asked the ladies, shall we go back? They said, no, we should not. And so their boat, about 60% full, likewise drifted while people callously listened on. On boat number six, the situation was reversed. The women begged quartermaster Hitchens to return, but he refused, painting a, a vivid picture in detail of what would happen if the floaters would get a hold of their boat. The women pleaded as the cries grew fewer. And of the 18 boats, only one returned to the scene. Number 14, and this was only an hour after the Titanic's sinking, when the, th when the thrashing crowd had, quote, thinned out. 
This is a stunning picture of a parable of a world gone wrong. Fallen humanity adrift on unfriendly seas, alienated, unable to help one another, despite a few rare attempts. And the wrongness of it all points to the fundamental problem of ourselves, of our sin nature. We are selfish, self-preserving, proud, uncaring, and unloving at times when put to the extreme test like this. What would we do? Stories of sacrifice on those waters that night were, were rare. Stories of selfish gain and self-preservation were plenty. But don't call those selfish individuals hostile in mind or evildoers. That's offensive. We don't want to hear it. When an 18th century Christian woman and encourager of God's servants, uh, Lady Huntington, she invited one of her friends, the Duchess of Buckingham, to hear George Whitfield preach. She was excited about this, so she sent this letter to her friend, but she received this reply from the Duchess of Buckingham. She said, It is monstrous to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl on the earth. Sense the irony there. This is highly offensive and insulting, and I cannot but wonder that your ladyship should relish any sentiments so much at variance with high rank and good breeding. Oh, the irony. Paul's words of being alienated, hostile in mind, and a doer of evil deeds might sound harsh, but the reality is it's, it's terribly true. Before Christ saved us, this is who we were. But this all changes because God did not choose to leave us in our rebellion. Verse 22 tells us how God has worked to reconcile us in his body and flesh through his death in order to present us what? Holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. So for all of our alienation, God is working to make us holy. For all of our hostility in mind, God is working to make us blameless. And for all of our evil deeds, God is working through his own son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to present us above reproach. So while we are presented a rather grim picture of, of who we are in verse 21, we see now how God has worked to bring us to one of the high, highest and noblest versions of our present state in him, in verse 22. Think about this. All of our fleshly acts... Every lustful thought, every impure motive, every lie, every slanderous word, every selfish act, even if it's a small thing, every deed in my life that should provoke really the wrath of God, all of it, every last bit, has now been called under my account. It has been canceled. It has been taken and nailed to the cross. For Christ has brought about peace in my life, bringing me into himself by the blood of his cross. And he's done this with you. His death in exchange for my life. And Hebrews, 1, or Hebrews 12 tells us that he did this out of his joy. He died for you. It was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. This is an amazing picture of love. Now, this is something to believe in. His saving grace in spite of my selfishness. And he, in his kindness toward me, has reconciled me to himself. Is Christ preeminent in our lives? Going back to last week. Are we running from God, or are we finding our refuge in Him? Are we believing whatever the world might tell us, or are we believing in Jesus Christ our Lord? In light of our reconciliation, we ought to do everything in our power to be 
practically blameless and holy in this life that he's given to us. We must become all that we are in the Lord. How do we do that? Well, we must submit ourselves ever more completely to the God who works in you, to quote Philippians 2. Romans 12, our bodies ought to be presented to Christ as a living sacrifice so that all that we do, both our words and deeds, would be part of our worship and praise of him as our creator and redeemer. Practical holiness should be our life's business, wherever it is, wherever we find ourselves throughout the day. And this is verse 23, what our salvation looks like at present practically. Let's read it all again because the whole thing really is just one long sentence, which is classic Paul, you might already know. But again, look at this again in, in specific attention to 23. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds... He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So here Paul is putting forth uh, this conditional statement saying, if you remain in the faith, then you will benefit from all these things I just told you about from, from verse 20 to this point. The reconciliation, the holiness granted to you, the, the blamelessness of your status in Christ and your being above reproach because of, of his faithfulness. All of these are yours if you remain in the faith, if your seed falls on good soil, if you build your house on the rock as Jesus teaches about and not the sandy land. And notice the verbs there. Uh, how he uses them to describe how we are to continue in the faith like a builder who builds his house on the rock. The rock is the stable ground. And so then the foundation is as well. And thus the building is steadfast, it's firm, immovable to all the wind and outside forces that might beat against it. You might read this as perseverance, as we establish our foundation, which makes our structure secure. Some of you might have noticed this week as you walk down the aisle, the structure's a little more secure. There's not quite a hole there anymore. Thanks to Elmer and Dennis giving up their time to come and do that for us. We've shored up our foundation, what's under our feet, a little further. Without that, we're on shaky ground. Shivery, when they're here, they're always wondering if caskets are going to make it over it. This is the language of a builder. If our building is steadfast, it's firm, immovable, unable to be be taken over by the winds and elements that beat against it. And for those that persevere and tie themselves, anchor ourselves in with Christ, are part of his temple, an immovable temple. One not built with human hands, that is prone to wear where moth and rust destroy, but his hands. A stronghold from our enemies and oppressors. A fortress that keeps us safe from the storms. And yet a place of welcoming fellowship with Christ our King. Our cornerstone. Whom the builders rejected. The positive application of this verse is, is uh, one, the gospel is not magic. There is activity that takes place within our rootedness in Christ. Our minds, our hearts, and our wills are all involved here. Our minds must feed on Christ and his word. Our hearts are to love him with abandon toward all other things. Our wills must take their desires from him and his pattern of life 
for us. Present faith leads to present results as the Spirit works within us. Present hunger means we must continue to eat. Present thirst must, means we must continue to drink. We are to be ever feasting and drinking of Him, our Savior, as He renews and replenishes us each and every day. It's of significance that when we take communion, we say, this is the body of Christ broken for you. It's a peace that is sustaining to us. This is his blood shed for us. Take and drink of it, his new covenant. And as he replenishes us, as we continue to feast and drink of him, there's no shifting then from the hope we have within us, the hope of the gospel we have heard. As Paul says, if you want to believe in something, believe in this. The love of Jesus Christ gifted to each one of us. If we are able to see ourselves for who we truly are, and if we are able to see him for who he truly is and what he has done for us, our lives ought to never be the same. As we go from, from sinners to to saints, dead to alive, alienated and hostile in mind, to welcomed in with open arms as adopted heirs. It's an amazing change, amazing significance to us in our lives what Christ has done. And this is the hope of the gospel which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which he says, Paul, he's a minister, and so am I, and so are you. We are all these ministers of the gospel. No matter where we are in life, the gospel is so momentous and so explosive that it must be proclaimed in every last corner of the world. This is the commission of the Great Commission in Matthew 28. The faith that we are called to continue in is the same faith for the whole world. It's not a relative thing. It's the faith. we are able to see Christ and his gospel clearly, we can't help but long for the gospel to go to the ends of this earth. And it also ought to go with us when we go to work, when we go to the grocery store, when we're on the road, wherever it is we have encounters with individuals around us, it ought to go with us there. It is imperative that we and the rest of the world be reconciled to Christ, because in him is life. Without reconciliation, we will remain adrift on the cold sea, alienated from God. In at least two of our songs this morning, we, we sung about the, the dangers of the sea. I don't know if you caught that, but, but I did. Uh, one was it as well. And the other one, Jody will tell you after the service. <laughs> and he wants to reconcile his people. He wants to be reconciled to you with us. He enjoys doing it as it's for our good and his pleasure to present us holy and blameless. Once again, his own son endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Believe in that. What a God we serve. What a sacrifice. What loving kindness. That he has our absolute best in mind, and so he did this for us. So there's only one thing for us really to do is, is cling to him in faith, persevere in the hope of the gospel, say yes to Jesus' desire to reconcile and be reconciled to him in faith. We have this desire for others too. D.L. Moody, uh, the namesake of my alma mater, related this incident between his sister and her son as he tells this story. He says, my sister, I remember, told me her boy said something naughty one morning. And when his father said to him, Sammy, go and ask your mother's forgiveness. I won't, 
replied the child. If you don't ask your mother's forgiveness, I'll put you to bed. It was early in the morning before he went to work, and the boy didn't think he would do it. He said, I won't again. They undressed him and put him to bed. The father came home at noon, expecting to find his boy playing about the house. He didn't see him and asked his wife where he was. In bed still. So he went up to the room and sat down by the bed and said, Sammy, I want you to ask your mother's forgiveness. But the answer was no. The father coaxed and begged, but could not induce the child to ask forgiveness. Maybe it's something that we can relate to. Well, at least, I, I mean, some are, some are more thick-headed than others. Again, that might be me as a child. The father went away, expecting certainly that when he came home at night, the child would have got all over it. At night, however, when he got home, he found the little fellow still in bed. He had lain there all day. He went to him and tried to get him to go to his mother, but it was of no use. His mother went and was equally unsuccessful. The father and mother could not sleep any that night. They expected every moment to hear the knock at their door by their little son. How they wanted to forgive the boy. My sister told me it was just as if death had come into their home. She never passed through such a night like this. In the morning, she went to him and said, Now, Sammy, you are going to ask my forgiveness. But the boy turned his face to the wall and would not speak. The father came home at noon, and the boy was still as stubborn as ever. It looked as though the child was going to win. It was for the good of the boy that they didn't want to give him his own way. It is a great deal better for us to submit to God than have our own way. Our own way will lead us to ruin. God's way leads to life and life everlasting. The father went off to his office again, and that afternoon my sister went in to her, to her son's room about four o'clock, and began to reason with him. And after talking for some time, she said, Now, Sammy, say, Mother, Mother, said the boy. Now say, For, For, Now just say, Give. And the boy repeated, Give. Me, said the mother. Me. And the little fellow fairly leaped out of his bed and said, I have said it, he cried. Take me down to Papa so that I can say it to him. What a picture of how we are. Just those words, Father, forgive me. Said from the heart, bring us to God. He wants to be reconciled to us. He has provided a way through his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Do we know him as our Savior? Do we know him as Father? Do we know him as friend? Because of his great love for us, because he has loved us first, do we also have the same desire for those around us? Do we persevere in our witness as people that are salt in light, desiring all those we know from, from here to across the world to know the same thing and be reconciled with Jesus. Do we have a love for God and do we truly love others in this way? Let's pray to close. God, we thank you for this morning. Uh, what a sweet thing it is to, to hear from our children, to uh, witness them as they they go into a school year. Well, they'll interact with many kids across many different backgrounds. Where they are at the forefront of the mission field in many ways. God, once again, I pray that you would grant them courage and understanding, that you would grant them perseverance in the faith that they have learned from their parents and this place. God, as they come back and share stories with us, I pray that we would be encouraged by what we hear. 
provoked even to go and do the same in the world around us. God, form within us, mold us, shape us more and more each day into the image of your Son so that we would have a heart like this, desiring and persevering for the world to know you and be reconciled to you. God, we thank you for your love, your your steadfast faithfulness, your kindness in revealing to us these truths from your word. That you haven't left us wondering about the world around us, wondering what it is we're seeing, wondering if there is a God or not, but you have given us this, this special revelation of who you are through your word. And so we thank you and are grateful for that. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this week. We pray that you would make your face shine upon us, your people, as we go about our routines. In your son's name we pray. Amen.